Merry Christmas, boys and girls. I'm so excited that you're here this morning, and I have a special and it is called The Newborn King. Have y'all heard of this one before? No? Well, good. This is the story of the birth of Jesus as told in the second chapter of Luke in the New Testament. In ancient times, the Roman ruler ordered a count to be taken of all the people who lived in the Roman Empire. Each person went to the town where they were born to be counted. A man named Joseph left his home in Nazareth and traveled to Bethlehem. His wife Mary, who was expecting her first baby, went with him. While they were in Bethlehem, Mary gave birth to a baby boy. They were staying in a stable because there was no rooms left for them to rent. Mary wrapped the baby in a soft blanket and placed him on the straw in the manger. Outside of the city, shepherds were sleeping in the field so they could protect their flocks of sheep. God sent an angel to tell the shepherds the great news, but the angel was shining so brightly that the shepherds were afraid. The angel sp spoke to the shepherds and told them he was bringing them wonderful news that was for all the people on earth. Today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly, more angels appeared, and they were all praising God and saying, Glory to God in heaven and on earth, peace to all men who believe in him. After the angels returned to heaven, the shepherds hurried to Bethlehem to see this newborn baby. There they found Joseph, Mary, and the baby who was lying in the manger, just like the angel had told them. The shepherds were so amazed by all this that they told everyone they saw about the wonderful new baby. Mary was happy. She kept these memories and treasured them in her heart. Returning to the fields, the shepherds were happy and praising God for all the wonderful things they have heard and seen. This special event is the reason we celebrate Christmas. So as we go through today, and as you think about it, we hear this story of why we celebrate Christmas and that baby that was born for us. So let's pray as we go back to our seats in just a minute. Dear God, thank you for these boys and girls that are here celebrating who you are. Thank you for the reason and the baby that was born, and we celebrate his birth today. Thank you for giving us all this time and bringing us all back together and being able here to know that a baby was born for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.
shepherds in fields as they Father, we thank you that we get to celebrate this season because of the birth of your son. And I pray, Father, that over the next few moments as we spend time together into your word, that you just simply just guide the time together, that you would allow us just to reflect upon the manger and the cross at the same time as they are ever together bringing forth the promise of redemption. And so, Father, just speak to us today in Jesus' name, amen. As you're being seated, I just encourage you and invite you, if, if you will turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 2, as you do so, again, just a couple things. If you don't have a candle, just kind of get the attention of one of our deacons, they'll do that. Or if you don't have communion, you'll need that uh, toward the end today. Uh, we can get that for you as well. And just let me encourage you, we're, we're actually not going to have announcements later. Just look at your bulletin. There are some very important things upcoming that we want to make sure that you are aware of and know about. There's some sign-ups you can have, and we encourage that uh, to that. And so today, as we come together, um, and, and let me say this too. I, I realize that, you know, parents, I get it, okay? Uh, I get it. And just let me say this, it does not bother me because I have a feeling that at that manger, it was pretty chaotic. And I love the fact that we get to be all together because it reminds us of life. It reminds us of that. You know, the last several weeks, we have been looking at conflict, haven't we? We've been looking at all the different crises that people engaged at the manger and, you know, I don't want to leave that without also saying this. It wasn't just that the manger was a moment of crisis, but the manger was also a moment of resolution. You see, for everything that happened at the manger that caused crisis in, in those people's lives that were right there, the child in the manger was the answer to them all. He was the answer to them all. And the reality is, is today, even when we come into play into all the different avenues and factors and things in life, the reality comes to that that child in the manger is still the answer today. No matter where we are, no matter whether we're in the mountaintop experiences or in the midst of the valley, Jesus is still the answer. And the reason is, is because we celebrate what? Emmanuel, which means God with us, which means that he is with us every single moment. It's more than just something we say. It's a promise about who he is, a promise of his presence, a promise of his strength, a promise of what he has done for us. And so I think today as we investigate the arrival of Jesus, 
And using really the shepherds in the nearby field that were just minding their business, doing their thing, when all of a sudden they were reminded how God often engages us where we are to lead us to where he desires us to be. And he is the resolution of all that. Let's so ask you, if you will, if you're able to stand for the public reading of God's word, beginning in verse 8 of Luke chapter 2. Of course, Mary has just given birth to Jesus. We know that it tells us that she gave birth to her firstborn son, and that has happened, and this is the aftermath. In the same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch overnight over their flock. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the city of David was born for you who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. Suddenly there was a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favors. When the angels had left and returned to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go straight to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. After seeing them, they reported the message they were told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary was treasuring up all these things in her heart and meditating on them. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had seen and heard, which were just as they had been told. Father, speak. Your children are listening. Lord, teach. We want to learn. Lord, guide, and may we respond. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. For the next few moments, I just want us to simply see how Jesus is the resolution to crisis in our lives. Because let's just be honest, during the Christmas season, we all face times of crisis, and throughout the year, we face times of crisis. And the reality is, is the crisis of revelation. When God begins to reveal things to us, often we are challenged about where he is leading us and guiding us. Let's be honest, over the next year, God's going to guide you in some things in your life. He's going to challenge you to participate in some new things. He's going to guide you to where he wants you to be on service for him, reaching and ministering for his kingdom and expanding and being an ambassador of his kingdom. And what we realize is that's going to challenge us to the very core of who we are. It's going to challenge us to ask the question, God, are you sure? But here's the promises that we have. The first is this, that God meets you where you are. God's not expecting you to be exactly where he wants you to be quite yet. He's going to begin by meeting you where you are. Notice in verse 8, it just says that shepherds were where? In their fields. It says they were in the same region, just minding their business, doing their job, watching their flock by night. When it tells us that Jesus or the Lord engaged with them right there. He he was not seeking those who had prestige or clout. He was not looking for those who appeared in the eyes of the world to be ready. He just needed simple shepherds who were minding their own business, doing what they were called to do, and he engaged with them, which should remind us that there is no one too small for God to use. But rather, he will meet even the smallest of individuals in the place where they are to make them giants of the faith. And that's what he's about to do in the shepherd's life. He's looking for individuals who are available and ready. I think on Christmas, as we celebrate the gift of of Christ, we also need to present ourselves as a gift to God and say, God, meet me where I am. I am ready. I am available. I am listening. I may not have all the answers. I may not have all the ability, but what I have is yours. And the promise in the cradle is that he will meet us where we are. And let's not be surprised if there's this shocking moment in the revelation when God begins to speak to us. Because let's be honest for a moment. As verse 9 says, an angel of the Lord stood among them. I'm not sure about you, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going to be shocked and amazed if an angel of the Lord shows up right in my presence. I'm going to be uh, very, not really concerned, but I'm going to be like, what is going on? I may not even be able to speak because what it is, is that the moment when God engages us, he will find a way to get our attention. He will find a way, whether we are willfully seeking him or hard-headed to get our attention. 
Have you ever had that experience when you say no to the Lord and he keeps working and speaking and speaking and finally he gets to the place where you're like, I can't deny this anymore. He is up to something and I need to pay attention to what the Lord is up to. Because the Lord revealed his glory when he engages with them and he does the same thing to us. He reveals his glory as it said, it's shown all around them. In the example of here is think about Moses for a moment. Moses wanted to what? See the face of God. But God knew he couldn't. But yet he obliged to it by saying, I'll tell you what, why don't you be here in the cleft of the rock? And as I go by, I will cover your eyes and you can catch a glimpse of the backside. And if you'll remember what happened, because he had been in the presence of God, his face and his head, it shone among the people. In fact, he had to wear a sack on his head. It was so bright. And the reality is, is when you and I are engaged by the Lord and he shows up, he gains our attention, then we get to be in the midst of his glory for a moment in which he is guiding us and directing us. And often it's going to challenge us to a place that unsettles us because it said the shepherds were terrified. And that's okay. Here's what I find. I find when God shows up and he begins to work in our lives and calls us to an amazing work in front of us, we are usually a little bit shaky. And the reason is, is because we usually think, I can't do that. And here's the reality and the truth, you can't. But God has called you, and so he can. And that's the promise. Fear is healthy when it's proper, an understanding of who God is and who we are not. And so as we see here, we see the crisis in the moment of the revelation, which goes with this also. Notice the communication that occurs in the revelation. What is the communication that happened there on that Christmas day, the original Christmas day, that I think goes throughout the generations and still speaks today to us? I think it was interesting in verse 10. It said, but the angel said to them, don't be afraid. For look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And so I think this is it. First of all, I think the child in the manger, the message from heaven for us still today is a message of affirmation. He affirms some things. He affirms when he says, don't be afraid, is the affirmation of provided assurance of the coming message. When he tells us, don't be afraid, it's an affirmation of, hey, what I'm about to tell you is okay. It's a comfort of, don't be scared, it's all right. I often think about it as a parent speaking to their child who is hesitant, saying, hey, it's okay, don't be afraid. Don't be scared, it's going to be okay. And it's as if the father is speaking to us, saying, it's going to be okay. I'm up to something, and you may not understand it yet, but if you'll just trust me, I've got you. And that's the reason he says, for look, it's the call of affirmation that the child in the manger should call us to search and to see what God desires in our life. You see, during this Christmas season, we should be reminded that God not only desires us to know him through Jesus as Lord and Savior and the gift of life, but when we have entered that, he also has affirmation for us that he has something in store for us that is far greater than we could ever imagine. And Christmas gives us a reason to recognize that. A reminder to realize, don't be afraid, but, but look and see what God is up to. Because in it, he provides a message of confirmation. So he gives affirmation, but he gives confirmation. He says, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. The messenger proclaimed a message of of confirmation that the Lord was up to something far greater than they could understand. And here's what it is. It's good news. But what is the good news? The good news is the Messiah, the Savior, the one, the sacrificial lamb has come. And he has come with the cross in his mind. He has come to pay the price that we deserve. The good news is that the Messiah has come, will do what we need, and invites us to the victor spoils of eternal life. The amazing part is that the good news is that there is hope for the hopeless, that there is peace that passes understanding, that that there is a love that is far greater than we could ever imagine. And that the reality is, is this promotes us to this moment of great joy because the receiving of good news brings great joy. Have you ever seen someone receive Christ and they care less? I mean, really, let's think about it. Have you ever seen anyone say yes to Jesus and they're like, eh, big deal? Usually, 
It's what? Celebration. It's excitement. We rejoice. People are, are extremely just ready to, to, to storm hell with a water pistol, basically, aren't they? They don't care. They want everyone to know they're excited, they're celebrating. It's because good news always leads to great joy. And the great joy comes because it's genuine, because of the presence of the good news. You see, joy occurs due to the changed state of one's life once we have entered a relationship with Jesus. That's when you truly can say, joy to the world. Because we declare the message of hope. That offers the only available, genuine, needed joy. And notice what it says. It's for all people. Folks, I think we overlook that often in the manger. Let's be honest. I think if we just speak to it clearly, we can all be guilty of the holy huddle. You know what the holy huddle is, don't you? The holy huddle is when we gather with other believers and celebrate or worship together with no intention of breaking the huddle. But the amazing part is the Messiah came not just for a few, but he came as an invitation and a gift offering for all. And as a result, yes, we celebrate in that holy huddle, but we break the huddle to make sure the world knows of the good news that brings great joy because it is inclusive, which means the message must be declared to all people of all nations, of all tongues, to invite them to respond to Jesus as Lord and Savior. But it is exclusive at the same time because it is not whatever you believe, but it is the belief in that child in the manger. There is no other way except Jesus. But he has made the way that all have the opportunity. It is a message of confirmation. It's a message that leads to joy because it's a message of declaration as it sees in verse 11 and 12. It says, today in the city of David, a Savior was born who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth, lying in a manger. Notice it says today, today, don't overlook that word. Today means right now. It means the time to respond is now. It means that there is urgency to go see this child in the manger. There is urgency to go engage with Jesus. There is urgency because delay is not an option. The idea is go today because a savior, one who rescues, one who is your deliverer, one who is your per, um, perseverer, the one who will preserve you is born. He is the truth. He is the savior. He's the deliverer. He desires you to follow and he's done it for you. Notice the urgency is today he was born for you. And folks, today, not only was he born for you, he died for you and he rose for you and he offered you the gift of eternal life. And today is the day of urgency. And why is this? Well, because he is the Messiah, the Lord. It tells us that. Who is the Messiah, the Lord, which means what? He is the anointed one of God who comes to save. It is as if he has been rubbed and, and, you, and, and ready and used as the ointment that sin has caused the pain upon us. And he offers the only healing ointment that is available to us. That is the concept here in Messiah. And as Lord, it means that when we allow him to heal us a relationship, that we provide him dominance and rule and control in our lives. And this drives us to the next message of adoration. Because when we are healed, we celebrate. We celebrate. What do we celebrate? Well, it says suddenly a multitude of heavenly hosts with the angel praising God and saying glory to God in the highest heaven and peace on earth to people he favors. Three Note three things quickly. Praising God. The heavens rejoice, don't they? The heavens celebrate. Listen, if heaven can celebrate, we better. If heaven can celebrate, we have a model. 
And so we celebrate praising God in the highest. And this is the recognition of the ultimate position of the Lord. When we sing glory to God in the highest, we're saying, I am elevating God to the very most prominent place in everything. Not just the world, not just the universe, but everything. And the reality is we're saying he is higher than everything else. And then it says peace on earth to the people he favors. Peace here is not the ceasing of conflict, but it is actually completeness. That means to the people he favors, the people that respond to him, the people who are his children, he brings completeness. And as a result, there's a message of an invitation. When the shepherds had left and returned, it says in 15, the shepherds said to one another, I just love that moment. It says, let us go straight, right? We'll see that in a moment, but notice something. The invitation by the angels was an invitation to join the work of the Lord. Notice that the invitation was the declaration of the birth of Christ, the glory of of God is being manifested, and their response is, hey, we're invited to join this. We're invited to do something with this. We're invited to join whatever the angels were talking about. The conclusion of the message was an open-ended call to respond to Jesus, and the child in the manger is an open-ended invitation to respond to the child in the manger named Jesus as Savior. It's an invitation to get on board with the work of God and to get on board and living in the word of God. It's a place in which we say we get into the invitation and get on board and with Jesus as our Lord and our Savior. Because when we hear the invitation, we have to do something with it. And that's the commencement in responding to the revelation. There's this commencement. There's this moment of something new starting and something ending. It's the idea of a beginning and an end at the same time. It says, let's go straight to Bethlehem in verse 15. The shepherds modeled something. They modeled that when we respond to Jesus, it must be immediate. They did not delay. They did not say, well, let's wait and see if what the message of the Lord said is true. They rather said, let's go see what he's doing. They they did not say, let us attempt to form the the perfect time of obedience or or plan every details of our journey. They just said, I don't know what the next thing holds, but we're on our way. And they're heading to a place in which there's knowing that they're going to be led to. And so they did not get detoured. They didn't make stops along the way. They didn't take the long way there. They found the shortest route and they went. How do we know that they didn't delay? Well, it says they departed with haste in some places. They went immediately. They went with obedience. They went with the desire to engage with the Lord. And why is that? Well, it says in verse 15 at the end, see what has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. They had a desire to see the God at work. Do you desire to see God at work this morning? I mean, really, do you desire to see God at work? All of us here this morning have probably had some experiences already this morning with with family around a tree, or you will have that later today, and that, those are glorious times. But on December the 26th, or the day after you have your last gathering, are you still celebrating Jesus, desiring to see him work? You see, the desire about the child in the manger is not one moment in, the, in a year, but rather should be every day a deepened desire in which we say, I want to see where he's at work. I want to see God doing what only God can do. And I want to make sure that his, that his priority in my life, that his desire for my life is what is dominating me. The shepherds look and they have responsibility. They have responsibility to take care of the sheep there out in the fields. They have responsibility to the people that may be paying them to do so. But dominant over that was, no, we have to see what God is up to. Because there is a moment of response to God's work. It said, after seeing this, they reported the message. This is verse 17. And now what's happened is they've seen Jesus. And so after seeing them, it says, as the shepherds see the evidence of God's declaration, the evidence of God's work, there's only one thing they could do is they responded by celebrating with the child in the manger, but they also responded by telling the world about the child in the manger. You see, what we have to recognize is the moment of response is when we say, Lord, 
I believe that the word has come from you. It's when we say, Lord, I believe that the word has come about the Messiah. I believe that the word has led us to this moment of responding to you. And as a result, there is a change in their life because there is a different return than the way they came. They came in response to God's invitation. They left declaring the greatness of God. They came at the invitation of God. They left doing the work of God. And what we mean by this is it says the shepherds returned. They went back to the fields to resume watching their flocks. That's what they did. But the return was different because of the change, what happened when they met Jesus. When you have met the child in the manger, is there a difference in your return? You cannot meet Jesus without a different return. Because he alters everything. We are. When they returned, they were glorifying and praising God because when you and I engage Jesus, there is one thing that we are just driven to do, and that's celebrate. That's celebrate. If you don't like to worship and celebrate and praise, you're probably not going to like heaven that much. Because a huge, major part of the eternal presence before God is praise, rejoicing, celebration. By the way, we practice here what will be perfected there and how beautiful that is because they had to tell what had been told. They had to tell it. And we've looked at this earlier in the month, but the personal response to the revelation was Mary as she stored these things in her heart and meditated on them. The idea of Mary kept these experiences in her mind was not for the moment, but for the long term. Think for a moment the day you met Jesus. Have you done that lately? On July the 16th, 1987, I remember very clearly sitting in a banquet hall in New Orleans, Louisiana, at an International Gideon Convention where I was part of the kids program and my parents were a part of doing the adult thing. And I remembered that banquet someone shared from Psalm 73, 24. And it said, you will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. And they went on to talk about what it means to be a child of God and for him to guide you with counsel and the promise of being received into glory. And it was at that moment I recognized my need for a savior And I have to stop at moments and reflect on that because I never want it to grow stale. Because once we meet Jesus and we treasure it in our heart, it alters our life forever. And in moments of difficulty, remember the moment of change. In moments of celebration, remember the moment of change. Remember when you met the child in the manger. Meditate on what it used to be and now what it is. Meditate as the word moves throughout you and you're growing in Christ, being transformed by the word. Because here's the reality. Every single one of us are born into darkness. Because every single one of us are plagued by sin. The Bible says it this way, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. And later it says, for the wages of this sin is death. But at Christmas we celebrate the rest of that. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that is is the resolution at Christmas. The resolution at Christmas. And if you have never come to that manger, if you have never come to that place, then Christmas is missing something for you. Because Christmas foreshadows something else. 
it foreshadows the cross. And you see, it would be about 33 years later, about 29 AD, when Jesus will hear the celebration of the crowds on a Sunday and hang on a cross on Friday. He will not be laid in a manger but in a tomb, sealed so he cannot escape. But Sunday came. And when Sunday came, just like the impossible was possible at the child in the manger, the impossible became possible and the tomb opened up. And out from the tomb came Jesus. The child in the manger had claimed the victory of a king. But you know what? He didn't withhold that. He said, I want to offer it to everyone. So why significant? Well, Jesus told us why it was significant and told us to remember it. And so just a moment together as we're here, reflecting on the child in the manger who became the Savior on the cross to the victor, divine warrior king who walked out of the tomb. On this Christmas day of 2022, I would invite you to join me as a moment of reflection. If you are a follower of Christ, we invite you to join us. Because what happened on that day when he was born started the course for the opportunity for you and I to be reborn. And on that day, the night before, actually, he actually took bread at what was called the Passover, didn't he? And what he did is he took bread and he broke it. And when he had broken the bread, he told them something very important. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. And the concept is, is he became broken like we are broken so that we could be put back together. That relationship could be put back together. And he told them to take and and eat this. And every time they did, they were doing it in remembrance of him. And they didn't quite fully understand it yet, but they were about to. And on this Christmas, I want to invite you to do something. I'm going to invite you to take this wafer that we represent as the body. And, And as you take this, I want you to think just for a moment how the child in the manger became broken for you. Take, eat, in remembrance of him. And just like the brokenness, we know he paid the death and he bled. Why blood? Because blood was needed on the altar to atone for the sin of our guilt. And unlike us having to come to the altar and sacrifice a lamb every single year, God, through his son Jesus, took care of it once and for all. You see, the child in the manger was the eternal sacrificial lamb. And at Christmas, we celebrate that he sent the sacrifice to pour out the needed blood offering that we could have life. And in this Christmas day, I invite you to follow the model that the early disciples and the early church took as Jesus took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant. He said, do this in remembrance of me so that you can constantly remember the importance of the sacrifice. And on this Christmas day, will you take the cup and remember the sacrificial lamb paid it all? Take, drink.
and on this Christmas day. Maybe you weren't able to partake because you've never come to meet the child in the manger. The sacrificial lamb that was born for you and died for you. And as the musicians are coming, I would ask these simple questions. If not, the child is in the manger. Will you make haste? Will today be the day of salvation? Let me tell you, the greatest Christmas gift you will ever open is Jesus. And what a day of celebration that will be. If you want to hear the church rejoice, then today is the day of salvation in Christ alone. Will you worship with the Lord today if you're a follower of him because of his work? Will you meditate upon him today in his word of promise? But will today be the day that you receive Jesus? Will today be the day you commit to obey Jesus? Will today be the day that you commit, even if you're already a follower, to, to make haste as he leads you and guides you? I can think of no better way to celebrate Christmas than for the unbeliever to become a believer and for the believer to commit everything they are to the child in the manger. What will you give to Jesus this morning? What will you receive from Jesus this morning? Maybe you need to come. JR and I will be here to receive any decision there may be. And the invitation will be this. Whosoever will, may they come. Let's stand and sing and rejoice and commit to the Lord. Make haste, for the day is the day of salvation. You're in a 
still I feed the cause. Let's tighten that last line. You willingly die. You willingly die. Your innocent life feed the cause. You may be seated where you are. I ask our deacons that are coming forward to do so and those who are turning off the lights, if we'll go ahead and start that process of turning off our lights. And as we think about our lights coming down on this Christmas day, I want us to remember the importance that you and I play in what happened on that day. You see, earlier, just a few moments ago, we lit the Christ candle and we saved the Christ candle until Christmas Day to remember that it was the light that came into the world. And when we think about that, when we receive Christ as Lord and Savior, something happens. And within us, all of a sudden, that darkness that is there disappears because we receive the light. And as we do that, we are to take that light and we are to pass it. And as we pass it to others, they begin to see the light of Christ in their life. And he begins to illuminate their life. And as he illuminates their life, we begin to see slowly but surely the life of others change. And what once was dark and held captive becomes a glorious light. As the deacons come throughout and begin to light our candles, as they light the ones on the end, pass it down to the next, as we remember how we are to take the light and pass it to one another. See as the light travels, as it impacts the world. And on this Christmas day, as we celebrate this change, as the candles are being lit, I'll ask if you will join me as we light our candles and conclude our time together with the simple singing of Silent Night. Silent Night, holy God's people said, Amen. Amen. Merry Christmas, and we will see you in 2023.